basically what it looks like before transfer. And these ones are ostrich bags. So here, smell this. Oh. On this episode of The Green Room, the Los Angeles Times series on cannabis, commerce, and culture in California, we've taken a road trip to Nevada City, California, about an hour and a half north of Sacramento to visit Stone Road Farms, a queer-owned 57-acre off-the-grid cannabis farm founded by 28-year-old CEO Lex Corwin to discuss the challenges of surviving the cannabis industry in this regulatory climate. How in the world did you find this place? Because it's close to Sacramento, but it's pretty it's far a out there. World. Yeah. We were getting priced out of properties in 2016 when there was kind of murmurings that California was going to go legal. Um, you know, it was it was abundantly clear that there were a lot of other people looking for property. I knew at minimum we wanted to do 20 acres, um, which is really good because the regs now say, like in this county in particular, you can't grow the max amount in the county unless you have at least 20 acres. Okay. Um, south facing slope. Uh, abundant water, really private, no neighbors within 500 yards of any size. I knew all about the setbacks and the regulations and all the different things that the county was gonna require of us. So I just kind of was like, let's find a property that's gonna hit as many of those right. as possible. Traditionally, these communities that have been kept out of the industry, it's because of a lack of capital. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like you can't go get a bank loan to start your cannabis business. You yeah. have to come from like a wealthy network or have access to a wealthy network to basically tap angel family office and private investors to get this going. When I started the brand uh, in 2016, we did a friends and family round and raised $250,000 on top of me personally putting in about $250,000. We started with what we thought was a good cushion. I made virtually every mistake in the book. And then that was really like the start of the climb, like figuring out how to do things legally um, and efficiently without spending millions of dollars. This is our nursery greenhouse, so there would be a tarp over these. Oh, so this was th this had plants in it earlier. Exactly, okay. and so all those little plants are now replanted in the greenhouse. When we get the plants, they're already about a month old, okay. and then we'll basically keep them in the container for in the building for about a month and then we'll start when they're a little stronger they can start to um you know kind of deal with the sunlight but mm -hmm. anything uh you know if they're basically long, younger than two months it could burn them where do they start before they come here you said they're about a month old by the time you get them here so a lot of the nurseries will offer either clones which are basically like six inches and they'll come in little rock wool cubes or mm -hmm. they'll offer teens which are closer to like 12 to 18 inch tall plants those have been probably growing for around three three months. Up until 2018, we could grow our product here and then just bring it into Stonewood branded products, pre-rolls, flour, what have you. Then when that July 2018 metric switched, the county wasn't open for applications up here. In the end of 2019, they were starting to open up for applications. We were one of the first applications in. Uh, we got our approval in 2020, and then we... So when did you get, what was the day? What was the day you got your approval? It was approval? July 2nd. July 2nd of yeah. 2020, you've, yeah. got, you've got the final paperwork. Mm -hmm. That means you have your local and your state license, yes. right? Yes, cultivation and distribution. Okay. Um, and then basically, like now that we had the AOK -okay to begin the build out, we started pretty much a year long, like we're still in a construction phase. Uh, you know, as you'll see, there's a lot of things that we're still finishing up. I mean, not only were the cannabis regulations really tough, but as they say, California has ne never met a regulation it didn't love um, and so you know it, it just just the fire requirements like we're dealing with an issue now where we have to have um, you know like many tens of thousands of gallons of water set up for a fire event you can't use it to water your plants exactly I mean you look at the cultivation tax for trim for instance we're like good trim in California is going for about $50 a pound. Okay. The tax is 54. These are the plants that will basically plant around 
the end of May, early June, and we'll just let them go the entire season. They're called full terms, outdoors. It's This is the most kind of predominant growing in Northern California. It's the cheapest. You're growing several different ways here. So it'll be basically three runs. The first run will be completed hopefully by like the first week of June so that that product can then hit stores in July. And then the second run of greenhouses will replant as soon as they're cut. Mm -hmm throw in all the plants, and then let those ones basically harvest towards the end of September. Okay. Um, and then, you know, these outdoors um, are really on their own schedule. There's four different genetics in this greenhouse. You know, the plants are doing really well. You can start to kind of see like the yellowish uh, leaves, which is signaling, okay, it's fall. We're getting ready to be harvested. This year, because the wildfire season was really bad, it tricked a lot of our outdoor plants, the smoke can basically block out the sun and trick the plants into thinking, into going into pre-flower. This is like a forearm size nug, like this will be probably about a quarter pound of flower uh -huh. um, once it's fully trimmed and dried, like just on this little stalk. Yeah. But these plants should be literally two or three times the size. And these the are the size. ones just to sort of revisit, were the ones that outdoors and because of the wildfires and the yeah. it, it cutting in on the sunlight, yeah. it, this is how it ended up. This year we just were faced with so many major challenges that just okay. the fact that we you know, yeah. have pulled a harvest and we'll be yeah. pulling another second one is yeah. a godsend. These plants were only planted probably about a week to 10 days ago. Okay. And so they're gonna be, you know, a fraction of the size of what the other ones are, but they're uh -huh. all on different schedules. They're okay. all about two weeks staggered. People in California, like the consumers, are really focused on freshness dates, packaging dates. Right. And so it's like, you know, if we bring 400 pounds of flour, it might take us a full, month and and do you have is is a is a best buy date because i've seen best buy is that is that a, a year from thing? Uh, yes a year from packaging we have 10 greenhouses so we'll probably pick five of the best producing strains that uh -huh. we grew this year and then just do an entire greenhouse of just that plant how much water does it take to grow so cannabis much. this way because no you always hear about the, the almond is like the, right. the the demon of the of the agriculture world they probably get around five gallons every other day uh, for the outdoor plants, like per plant. And so like just on a weekly basis, you're looking at, you know, maybe around 15 to 20 gallons. 20 gallons a week over the it's course like of a- like 100 of the, that's, I mean, six months. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's going to be, you know, almost a thousand gallons of water yeah. uh, per plant. I think you mentioned that this was the first time that you've actually had to buy like a truckload of water yeah, so the water issues, I mean, we had never done, like the most plants we had ever done before were a thousand plants, mm -hmm. and this year we did 7,000. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, it was just a little bit too much for our well to do. California has been in a drought for literally years, and like last year was one of our driest winters ever. We okay. got, you know, usually up here, we might get two, three, four feet of snow. I was gonna ask And I yeah, I mean, we maybe got six inches last yeah. year. And so just all the water tables that we needed to have replenished, um, you didn't know, get replenished. didn't get yeah. replenished. Stone Road's grand vision doesn't stop at cannabis production. Lex hopes to turn the farm into a destination that will include lodging and weed tastings. Are you hoping that you'll get to a point where you'll be able to do like the wine tastings? For the tasting on site, you have to have a consumption license, but obviously like if someone is making the trip all the way up here and wants to try some of the products, we will, you know, give them as much education as we can. I mean, that's really ultimately like the secret to the industry is just educating more consumers at the top of the property you know we have 57 acres here so it's really it's really quite private this is basically where we've decided um, we'll put some mini homes and okay. allow kind of an Airbnb experience. Uh, one, logistically, legally, um, we could subdivide the property and still be allowed to do the largest um, legal amount while keeping this a completely separate property. So what you were talking about in terms of the regulations, uh -huh. consumption lounge, it's like, okay, well, if they're just renting an Airbnb on a completely oh, right. separate property. That's not part of the grow. Okay. Exactly. Okay. 
Um, so that's one idea of kind of how to you know work within the regulations. We talked a lot about all, you know the, the regulatory climate in California. Yeah. You know, and that this is an outdoor grow, so there are challenges. Why are you still jousting at that windmill, Don Quixote? I believe wholeheartedly that there's just like an unbelievable amount of potential. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's literally no other industry that's this new. And I thought cannabis, like this is an industry that you know, young people can shine. BIPOC people could really kind of make it theirs. I'm gay, so for, you know, queer people, even though there's not as like such blatant, um, you know, like headwinds against because it's more easy to like straight pass right, than right. if you're a black person, then yeah, there's yeah. like, you know, it's more kind of explicit bias. It was a way that we could basically like make the industry what we what we wanted to see out of it before all these like huge corporations came in. It's one of the few industries where I think most people understand a rising tide lifts all boats. And so the people who are in it for the right reasons, like we're all down to work. Yeah. with each other and we're all down to support each other yeah. because we know that like we'll be stronger together. Yeah. We grew over 600% in 2020 and established ourselves as like a real player. Yeah. We've already bought um, you know our neighbor's property and are planning on increasing our cultivation footprint by about 50%. And how many acres was that did you say? Um, so the next door property is 13 acres okay. and so we'll basically be allowed to grow around 5,000 square feet so half the amount we are now but yeah. I mean that that's basically enough to grow around 312 outdoor plants. And so, you know, a well-tended plant, you know, that's about a thousand pounds. You'll have to change the name from Stone Road to Stone Freeway. Yeah. <laughs> Stone exactly. Highway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>